Good morning, Saints. Uh, welcome to our Sunday School study. Uh, we'll be picking up where we left off in the 1689 London Baptist Confession. Uh, last week we left off in chapter 25 concerning marriage, the topic of marriage. Uh, uh, and this week we'll be covering paragraph three of that same chapter. Uh, before we do, let us seek the Lord for guidance. I'll pray. Uh, Father, Lord, you are awesome, uh, majestic, holy, and wonderful, O Lord, in every institution that you uh, have created, O Lord, the way you've ordered marriage, O Lord, what it reflects, the gospel, the love between Christ and his church, church submission to her groom and king, Christ, O Lord. We praise you for this, O Lord. We thank you that you give marriage unto men, O Lord, uh, for companionship, O Lord, and so that, O Lord, there may be mutual aid, O Father God, in doing your will, and so that godly offspring may come about, O Lord. So many blessings associated with that, and I pray as we study this doctrine, you would grant us your grace to um, uh, seek to apply what we, what we learn, O Father God, to our own lives, O Father God, to affirm these truths, O Lord, uh, and to, to glorify you by it, O Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we'll be going over paragraph three this morning. I'm sorry if I sound a little nasally. I've been battling a cold this week, uh, so bear with me. Uh, and I'll read, I'll read that for you. It should be on your sheet in page one. Everyone who is able to give rational consent may marry, yet Christians are to marry in the Lord, reading from the modern English. Uh, therefore, those who profess the true religion should not marry unbelievers or idolaters, nor should the godly be unequally yoked by marrying those who lead evil lives or hold to damnable heresy. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at this paragraph in two angles, um, examining first God's liberality, right, his, his, his openness, his, his permittance uh, in marriage. That's going to be section one. And then secondly, God's distinction in marriage. Right. Uh, we've seen that there are certain distinctions inherent in marriage. Right. Who can get married? Who cannot? Um, and we'll see that a little bit further this week as well. That will be section two. God's liberality in marriage and then God's distinction in marriage. But without further ado, let's look at section number one, God's liberality in marriage. And I'll read the part of the paragraph that uh, speaks to that. Everyone who is able to give rational consent may marry. Uh, the Confession's authors begin the paragraph by making a rather liberal statement about marriage. Right? What do they say? Uh, everyone who's able to give rational consent may marry. Although, in this instance, I personally flavor the original English wording, which, I've, as I provided here for you, also reads, It is lawful for all sorts of people to marry, who are able with judgment to give their consent. I'm actually thinking, hmm, all right, everyone, all sorts of people, isn't that just a difference without a distinction? Isn't that just semantics? And perhaps it is. Um, however, the word everyone found in the paragraph's modern English rendering can be misconstrued to, to, to broaden the clear parameters uh, defining marriage, which are set forth both in God's word and are also outlined in this confession. Right. At the very least, it can prove problematic if not understood within its proper context. And context, as we know, is key. Right, so to briefly recap, the last two paragraphs have clearly defined both the divine pattern for marriage as well as uh, the distinct purposes for marriage. That's what we covered in chapters one and two. In chapter one, which Brother Greg covered two weeks back, the authors rightly assert that, quote, marriage is to be between one man and one woman, a truth all but lost in Western society today, as we see. Uh, even still, it really can't be much clearer than that. Marriage is a sacred human institution uh, and arguably the oldest and most foundational of human institutions. Right. It predates economy, education, military, and even government. Marriage came first. Moreover, marriage is also a sacred unifying covenant. Right. Or agreement. That's what a covenant is entered into before God. Right. By no more than two qualified persons. And these two parties or uh, persons or parties consist of one man and one woman. Adding to that, there's no closer human relationship than that which exists in marriage, right, between a man and his wife. Neither those which exist between friends, siblings, parents, or even children uh, hold preeminence over marriage. 
But what about the duration of this covenant? How long are said parties to be engaged in this covenant agreement? And with that, I open the floor to you guys. How long are two individuals that get married supposed to stay married? Exactly, exactly. That's why in our vows, the ones that we don't sort of try to change and customize ourselves, we read till death do you part. Those aren't just arbitrary words, right? Uh, for as long as either of the two parties shall live, that's as long as a marriage is supposed to be, you, you know, ideally. Uh, this has been the case since Genesis, even before the fall, when everything was good, indeed very good, before, but for the brief moment where man was alone without a helper suitable for him. We read in Genesis uh, 2.24, uh, Jamel, would you mind reading that for us? Mm -hmm. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Amen. Thank you. Right, and while, of course, throughout Scripture we see many examples of polygamy being practiced, and Greg covered this, even among the godly, we think about Abraham, we think about Jacob, David, and etc. We have to understand that uh, this was neither God's design for marriage uh, in mankind in marriage, nor was it his, his, his will of command for him either. Right? We know there's two types of will, God's divine sovereign will, like that decrees everything, but also his will of command, what he desires out of us. Uh, and the same applies to divorce and remarriage, although there uh, are lawful and biblical grounds for divorce, namely infidelity, right, adultery, cheating, uh, or even abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. But even in those instances, divorce is never encouraged nor deemed uh, desirable in the eyes of God. After all, this is the same God whom in ages past once declared to his people through his prophet Malachi. He says in Malachi 2.16, for I hate divorce says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of armies. So be careful about your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Um, there in the context of um, the people of Judah forsaking the wives of their youth. Um, and the ultimate reason for God's disdain for divorce, uh, as well as his displeasure for man's deviance from the natural and divinely ordained parameters of marriage, right, how God defines marriage, the reason it'll never be good nor just nor right to mess with holy matrimony is, is because lawful marriage is a reflection of God's love for his, for his people, for his covenant people, right? Even Christ's love for the church, his bride. And as an earthly reflection of a heavenly reality, lawful marriage is therefore intended to glorify God. That is its chief purpose, right? Although the framers of this confession, they don't, they don't explicitly uh, touch on this in these four paragraphs. Um, this aspect, right, um, of, of Christ's love for the church, church love for Christ, perhaps because it might have been already widely understood by their congregants. Um, but just as we learned last week with Pastor Phil, their summary of the purposes of, of marriage were more practical, and they were threefold, right? Marriage, one, firstly, as a means of mutual help for husband and wife, right? Husbands are meant to help, uh, wives are meant to help their husbands, even as husbands are meant to help their wives in fulfilling God's mandate. Right? What was God's mandate? Do you remember? Going back to Genesis? Fruitful and multiply, right? And serving Him, of course, in the various ways that we even do now. Secondly, marriage uh, as the only legitimate means for procreation uh, and the proliferation of the human race, i.e., God desiring godly offspring. And then, thirdly, the prevention of uncleanness. What do we mean by uncleanness? Adultery, right? Lust fornication, all of these things that are outside of the will of God in terms of uh, sexual relations. Uh, he, he, that's supposed to be enjoyed within marriage. And of course, the proper enjoyment of marital intimacy. Uh, those are the three purposes uh, that we learned uh, for marriage. Nonetheless, these practical purposes do not detract in any way from the main purpose, right, which is always to glorify God. Uh, rather, they complement and support it. And spiritually speaking, we are the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom, right? Relating to male and female aspect, right? Uh, and in a spiritual sense, our relationship with him is monogamous, right? As marriage is supposed to be, right? Christ having one bride in his church and the church having one Christ, right? Um, but the greatest beauty of it all, in my opinion, is Christ's covenant with us. It, in the fact that it's an everlasting one, right? Our Lord Jesus is faithful. He's gracious. He's forgiving, kind, understanding, compassionate, righteous, 
Uh, and, and by no means least of these characteristics, loving. He, he truly loves his people. Uh, and what greater evidence of said love is needed when we ponder his willingness to lay down his very life for those people? And that's, that's agape love, right? That's the goodwill love of God uh, for, for all of his saints whom he will never forsake. No greater love than that in all the scriptures. He's everything that human husbands, uh, such as myself, especially Christian husbands, also such as myself, are called to be for their wives. Although we fall woefully short at times, he nonetheless remains our example and our goal to follow, which is why in the New Testament scriptures, Paul's constantly always pointing to that and Peter as well. Um, but yeah, and accordingly, wives are likewise called to faithfully submit to their husbands, even as uh, unto the Lord, right? Even as the church endeavors to submit herself to the Lord in all that she does, right? The church doesn't just move on her own directive. Oh, this is what we're going to do. The church, ideally, we know that in a lot of cases we see churches in America just doing whatever they want, worshiping however they please. Uh, but we, we submit ourselves to the Lord. And, and that's the pattern for wives as well, right? And Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 captures all of this better than I have time to. Uh, right now, but coming back to our original discussion on paragraph three, our paragraph for this morning, we find that there are at least three defining parameters in which that word everyone is to be understood contextually, right? We said context is key. And firstly, the term everyone or all sorts of people, as I, as I would prefer, specifies that marriage is a human institution, right? Adam was brought all the animals by God, not merely so that we can know what a zebra is when we go to the Bronx Zoo. Uh, but so that, among other things, such as establishing headship over all creatures, that Adam would realize that neither that zebra nor any species in all creation would ever be suitable to him as a helper, right? At least not in properly undertaking God's special mandate for him, being fruitful, multiplying, having dominion over the earth, right? Remember, he was formed from dust and placed in the garden. Why? Who remembers why God says Adam particularly was formed? Genesis 2, right, to, to, to work and to keep the garden in which he was placed. Some of the translations will say to tend and to keep or to garden to keep. That's why Adam was made, right? Uh, that would have been his personal duty. However, and more broadly, right, uh, as a species, uh, as was determined amongst the Godhead immediately prior to his creation, right, when they said, let us make man in our image, uh, and, and then immediately after, Adam and his descendants were commanded to Genesis 1, 8, 128, rather, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Right? There would be no way for multiplication and fruitfulness except between members of the same species. Hence why upon naming all of the animals, Scripture tells us that, quote, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him, Genesis 2, uh, 220b. Mind you, everything up until that point had been deemed good by God, right? Days one through, through six. Uh, the light, the sky, the land, the seas, the sun, the moon, the stars, and trees. Uh, all of this was good except for the solitude of man, or, or rather his lack of human companionship. It was it's not good for a man to be alone. Uh, and it's unclear whether or not Adam would have felt a sense of incompleteness, because after all, he did have the fatherly love of, of the Lord. Uh, but... Even if something did seem amiss, which is speculative, it was promptly remedied when from his own rib, God fashioned a single creature whom Adam instantly and exuberantly recognized to be the one. Can someone read Genesis 2.23? Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of him. Amen. At last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Right? Something like he'd been seeking or longing for. And as a point of potential interest, this is a side, many biblical scholars and historians believe this verse, right, Genesis 2.23, to be a form of Hebrew poetry, which is why you notice it looks different in your Bibles than the, the verses around, around it, right? Structured more like a psalm than just a regular paragraph. Uh, and so that's true. The first poem in recorded history is a love poem from our first father to his first mother, for, to our first mother, right? Adam to Eve. And this indicates that uh, either what he found, he found what he was missing, or that he discovered what he found, uh, he, that he didn't even realize that he was missing what he found until he had found it, right? 
She was truly and unmistakably human, a fellow image bearer of God. And, and though distinct in role and ability, she was equal in value, right? In every way, Adam and Eve were complementary for each other, right? Equal in value, not equal in role. Uh, and that's why they're complementary. They're able to fulfill God's mandate in their own respective ways, yet together, right? And, and the same goes for us, being their heritage. Now, one would think this would be a moot point, right? Like, come on, all right, I get it. Don't marry animals. Uh, yet in our day of increasing sexual perverseness and confusion, not to mention continued and intentional rejection of God's truth in the scriptures and common sense, we have otherwise rational adults not willing to acknowledge the clear distinctions between male and female. Uh, truths like these are becoming ever more necessary to affirm. Uh, not to mention the same God who through Moses provided the account of creation in Genesis four, in four different occasions from Exodus to Deuteronomy sp speaks on this, right? Uh, bestiality. So apparently it was a thing back then, at least among the nations. Uh, and if assuming uh, this was so, and the wisdom of God holds true, it's not unlikely to happen again in some parts of the world, right? But that's parameter one. Everyone equals all sorts of people, humankind, right? That's everyone who is permitted to, uh, who, who, who can be married. Parameter number two, and this one's far more relevant to us today, right? The term everyone only applies if the person whom you're married is a member of the opposite sex. There was once a time where this wouldn't have been a, 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 like a thing that it would have been taken for granted. Now, this has to be clearly defined. Um, suffice it to say, no Adam and Steve, no Sarah and Eve. As we've discussed already, God prescribed one man and one woman for life. This was his created order, and it was the only means by which godly offspring, which is what he desires, can come about. Right? Furthermore, and as previously mentioned, marriage is a picture of the gospel. And it, therefore, any deviation from it, it it's, it's, an, it's, it's both abhorrent but it's also an affront to God and his very gospel. You, you know, just thinking what you say right now, you know, and, and thinking about, about what the Catholic Church did when it comes to, you know, blessings, you know, same-sex relationships. You know, how in the world can, you know, can you bless something that, that's sinful? If you say you live, you know, you go by the word of God, you know, you look into the scriptures, mm -hmm. you know, and you say that you're the true church, why would you go contrary to what the scriptures say? Because hmm. you don't truly believe it. And, and we're going to touch on that in a later point when, when uh, in the paragraph they're talking about uh, those who basically, they're, they're unbelievers, but their unbelief is in the form of just not living what they profess. Uh, and, and, and we'll touch on that in a moment. But yeah, it's, it's the repudiation and rejection of God's word. Also, so the Roman Catholic Church uh, does not view the word as the final authority. The church is the final authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's how they justify them being able to change you know, the rules, if you will. Yeah. yeah. No, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is the heart of the issue with same sex partnerships, right? And I say partnerships because. They're certainly not marriages, at least it's not as far as God is concerned. Um, it's not being hateful, that's just being honest. Uh, it's not merely a deviation from long-held societal norms, right? Human, it's not just a human thing. It's an assault upon God and his very gospel, again. But moving on to parameter three, we see that marriage should only be undertaken between a man and a woman who are each able to rationally consent, right? Uh, as the paragraph says, to the same. And the key words there being man and woman, as opposed to boy and girl, or man and girl, or boy and women. And yes, rationally consent as well, right? And here again, I, I probably favor the framers' original wording, which states, who are able with judgment to give their consent. All right? Sound judgment is absolutely indispensable when it comes to seeking a spouse. Uh, remember, this is a lifelong endeavor marriage this is not something that should be entered into lightly one could profit much and save themselves from a load of trouble in the long run if their skills of discernment uh and ability to judge another's character have been clearly honed right and i go so far as to argue that divorce rates even among professing christians might be significantly lessened if people exercise right judgment in who they chose to be their spouse not only just looking at outward things not only looking at superficial things 
but more important things, right? Um, right judgment or rational consent is presumably the reason why just about every state in our union, right, in America, has a legal age of consent, ranging from 16 to 18 generally. Uh, anything below that requires the additional consent of a parent or legal guardian, because while marriage is a beautiful gift of God, it certainly ought to be cherished and encouraged and thoroughly explained to our children. It's also an extremely weighty undertaking. Uh, it should not be entered into lightly, as I mentioned, right? Marriage is serious and permanent, therefore it requires sound judgment, and judgment generally increases and matures with experience, and experience generally with age. You know, I don't see very many individuals under the age of 16, 17, 18 being able to rightly make a decision like this. And that's why it's codified in law, right? Now, as a side, when I say experience, I no way mean that we should encourage our kids to just go out, uh, or, or ourselves for that matter, to just go out, assuming we're not already married, and, and date as many people as possible so that we can kind of figure out who our soulmate should be. That's, that's, not, that's not what the counsel is on experience. Right, on the contrary, we should heed the words of the speaker in Song of Solomon, who on three separate occasions pleads with the daughters of Jerusalem not to try and awaken or stir up love before the time, before it pleases, rather. In other words, we should patiently and temperately trust in the Lord, who is the provider of love, right? If we know he's the one who institutes marriage, and if marriage is something that we desire, we should seek him, but with wisdom and patience, not trying to force or rush things, right? Trying to force or rush feelings or loves, uh, searching endlessly with incorrect motives uh, and, and, and goals and ideals, usually ends up more often than not in disappointment, in heartbreak, in unhealthy fatuation, which is idolatry. And sadly, I know this from experience. But all parameters haven't been defined as a general rule. So long as you are a single man or woman seeking a human spouse of the opposite sex and with sound judgment, usually implying, uh, among other things, proper marrying age, uh, are able to give rational consent, then congratulations you are qualified to be married. And that's the beauty and, and liberality of God who is himself impartial. As far as he's concerned, there need not and ought not be any barriers to marriage on the basis of arbitrary things like ethnicity, right, skin color, uh, cultural background, nationality, education, socioeconomic status, physical appearance, or even disability. Those things need not be barriers to marriage. Uh, it can all serve to glorify God. It's stupid to think that there was once a time uh, where it was considered sinful for some, for, for a white woman to marry a black man, or vice versa. Both are children of Adam. Both share the same ancestry, uh, created in the image of the same one true God. But though we live in a time and place where these things are like no-brainers anymore, they're, they're, they're basic points, uh, it, it wasn't always like that. Pastor Phil? Yeah, and, you know, this, uh, since evolution is taught in our schools, um, you know, uh, it, it was seen that people were different races. Yeah. And there's only one race, the human race. Only one. Yeah. So there is, um, I mean, they they came against Zipporah. I don't know if you're going to get to that with Moses' wife and um, Miriam and Aaron. God gave them leprosy for being prejudiced against Moses' wife, Zipporah. Yeah. Um, I think, what was it, the other wife? He didn't want, he had two wives. Um, but, yeah, it's the, the whole aspect of, of the whole belief system that there are different races of people, no Christian can believe that. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Um, because, you know, like you're, I know you're going through, you're thinking going through, you know, the criteria is that two people are in, everybody's in Adam. But it's only those in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Because that 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 whole mentality that is brought into the, brought into the church on, on a large. Right. right. So Mike is is gifted in teaching and preaching. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what I look like. Doesn't matter what ethnicity we are. God gifted different individuals in the church, <laughs> and so. Um, God puts his gifts into all people of all ethnicities, and God puts people together uh, of all ethnicities, and, and he says it is good. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, I mean, needless to say, discrimination, you know, on the basis of these things is not only wrong, it's unbiblical. So that, therefore, it's definitely wrong. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in the late 17th century, kind of putting it into the context of the framers of this confession, right? When this confession was signed and widely adopted, things like homosexuality wouldn't have been a, a fraction of the issue they are today. Uh, certainly not openly or formally. However, uh, certain other distinctions, such as those between people of differing social cl roles and class, uh, might have been a cause for hesitation in the consideration of marriage. And a prime example uh, of this would have been among the clergy. And a longstanding uh, question amongst reformers in England was, could ministers, pastors, clergymen take a wife? Can they, can they take wives? Can they be married? Or rather, should they? Uh, and the answer may seem as clear as day for us now, but remember, for centuries, the official teaching of Rome uh, forbade church leaders from marrying. In other words, it was mandatory celibacy across the board. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't an option, although some, of course, did it privately, and, well, but that's not a here nor there. And, and though many Baptists, even by this third wave of, of the Reformation, they considered themselves third wave reformers, would have shed the lion's share of, of Rome's unbiblical practices um, by this point, some might have wondered whether or not there was any validity to uh, uh, or wisdom in in sort of remaining celibate as a matter of practice for people of the of the of, of the clergy. And the answer to that particular point, that one, right? It, should they? You know, is it wise? Is it valid? That's a bit more nuanced than a simple yes or no. Uh, some have the gift of singleness, uh, spoken of in First Corinthians seven seven, but not everyone does. Needless to say, what's not nu nuanced is any prohibition of marriage as a matter of doctrine. That's, that's unbiblical. Uh, concerning, the, the, uh, concerning this, the Apostle Paul, he cautioned his protege Timothy with a prophetic warning concerning just this. Can someone read Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5? Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will be part from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insecure, insert, sorry, Insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Thank you, sister. So when the confession says it's lawful for all sorts of people to marry, uh, it most definitely includes clergy. And this is only right considering the vast majority of people over whom uh, these clergymen would have been shepherd are likely married. Right. What Christ like examples would there be to imitate if none of our leaders or none of our spiritual leaders were married? You know, there'd be like I, I've looked at Pastor Pete and Gloria in marriage so many times uh, since I've been married to Angie for wisdom and, and you know, something to emulate. What if that wasn't a thing, an option? Uh, plus, besides this, any such notions to the contrary wouldn't even align with the practice of most Christians in the apostolic age. Right? First Corinthians 9 through to 5, Paul says, This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and brothers yeah. of the Lord and Cephas? See also First Timothy 3, 2 to 5 and Titus 1, 6. Right? Talking about qualifications for deacons and overseers, husbands of one wife. You know, so I don't know how Rome missed this, but doctrines of demons. Uh, furthermore, being that God's sacred institution of marriage is good, it is thus by no means limited to the people of God, right? Uh, unless, of course, either either of the two parties that are being married is, of course, a child of God, right? Then they have to marry another child of God, and we're going to get into that in a moment. But just as the author of Hebrews writes, marriage is to be esteemed honorable among all, assuming the qualifying parameters which we've out, outlined are, previous, are, are met. Hebrews 3, 13, uh, 13, 4. Can someone read that? Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Right, it is honorable among all. Marriage is not just for Christians, but it's for everyone. Uh, and it's to be universally esteemed as a rich blessing from our Creator, right? Even when two unbelievers marry, uh, Christians should acknowledge that union as, as something honorable, right? When one spouse is converted to Christ after uh, that marriage, right? They were both married as unbelievers, but then one got saved somewhere along the line. That marriage is still to be honored as, 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 as honorable, right? 
But while these freedoms exist for mankind in general, these liberalities, right, there's one particular group upon whom certain additional restrictions are placed, and, and that for good reason, and that group is, is us. It's the Christians. Which brings us to our next and final point in section number two, God's distinction in marriage. And I'll read that portion of the paragraph. Yet Christians are to marry in the Lord. Therefore, those who profess the true religion should not marry unbelievers or idolaters, nor should the godly be unequally yoked by marrying those who lead evil lives or hold to damnable heresy. Right, if we had to summarize this, this latter portion of the paragraph, we could simply state that believers in Christ must not marry un any unsaved person, regardless of the form that person's unbelief takes. And the framers provide four examples of said forms of unbelief. The first form of unbelief speaks about infidels, which simply means unbelievers, right? Whether atheists or agnostics or any other person who does not believe in the truth of God as revealed in scripture, nor his son, right? And they deny the living God. Those are infidels. That's what that means, right? Second form of unbelief. The confession then mentions idolaters, which is any person believing in or worshiping a false God rather than the one true God, again, as revealed in the scripture. And of course, his only son, Jesus Christ. This means Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, practicing Jews, uh, to name a few, are all a no-go. <coughs> Thirdly, marriage is also prohib prohibited between, uh, quote-unquote, believers and such, uh, be well, between believers and such as are wicked in their life. Uh, and this is uh, the point that I was bringing out earlier. In other words, those whose conduct and way of life as a whole consistently resemble that of an unsaved person. Even if they seem to be religious, even if they profess certain truths, and yet their life doesn't add up to what they, what they say, yeah. right? These are, these are definitely off limits, and, and almost kind of one of the most to be cautioned because you may not always see it that clearly. Uh, and herein lies our serious need for maturity, wisdom, discernment, and sound judgment, as we mentioned earlier. Right. Of course, we can't uh, uh, know the depths of our own. We, we can't know the depths of our own hearts, let alone anyone else's. God searches this out. However, we can perceive the issue, their issue, the issue of the heart. We can perceive the fruit. Matthew uh, 15, uh, 18 to uh, 18 to 19, if someone can read that. Right, so we should have our ears tuned. What does this person speak about? What do they say? What constantly comes out of their mouth? What is, you know, this may be an indication of, of, of an unbelieving heart. Uh, Titus 1, 15 to 16, if someone could get that. Right, so professing no God, but they deny him by their works. The two doesn't add up, right? And, and so we need to be paying attention to these things. I'll read Matthew 15, oh, 7, 15 to 20. Go ahead. So if you're contemplating marrying somebody, they, they say they're, they really believe in Jesus, but there's no fruit in their life, there's no evidence of salvation, you better run for your life. Yeah, way, right? absolutely. And, and you should, you know, that's another reason maybe you shouldn't rush to get married. You should first try to learn, endeavor to learn about this person, yeah. uh, not only in your observation, but from people that are around this person that have observed him for longer, him or her for longer. Uh, Matthew seven fifteen to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. So God has given us uh, ability to discern, uh, and, and certainly by his word, we, we see that. Um, now, of course, walking like Jesus doesn't mean perfection, right? Uh, and, and by this, I'm referring to uh, the, the verse we skipped, 1 John 2, 3 to 6, right? 
Uh, we know that we're him, and whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way that he walked. Walking like Jesus doesn't mean perfection. Uh, that's impossible on this side of eternity, right, in this life. Uh, therefore, it's also unreasonable to expect perfection from others. However, uh, walking, we know walking like Jesus speaks more to direction. What is the direction of this person's life? How are they oriented, right? What are the things that they, that they prize? What are they seeking? What do they strive for? You know, none of us is perfect, but, but each of us has a direction, right? Is it oriented towards God? This is what you want to make sure you understand and you can see before you, you marry someone, especially a professing believer. But finally, the fourth form of unbelief, uh, as mentioned in the paragraph, are those who maintain damnable heresy. And this doesn't simply mean that they are uh, 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 of a different persuasion in certain teachings and doctrine of the Bible, but rather that what they believe is so contrary to the scriptures that no genuine believer could embrace and continue in it, right? So it's not just like, you know, marrying someone with, uh, you know, uh, 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 Pentecostal leanings or stuff like that, but like someone who denies the Trinity, someone who denies the deity of Christ, someone who dies like salvation by the Lord alone, by, by Christ alone. Um, things such as that, weighty gospel issues. You know, if, if, if someone is persisting in that, you better stay away. Um, it's these of whom Jude wrote, uh, Jude verses three to four. Beloved, though I was very eager to write to you about common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once and all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed long ago who were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Right, and Paul cautions the same, even hypothetically concerning himself. He says to the Galatians in Galatians 1, uh, 8 through 9, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Right, so this bars Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Black Hebrew Israelites, and other cults that we don't have time to list. Um, it, it, it may be of use to note that the Westminster Confession, the Savoy Declarations, which are two earlier confessions on, upon which this confession heavily relies, they include papists, which would have been people uh, who, who were adhering to Roman Catholicism, right? Um, this confession doesn't have that, but it's probably because the Baptists were including that in those who commit these damnable heresies, maintain damnable heresies. Um, but while there are these differences, uh, it, it, there are you know slight differences in these four forms of unbelief, they all have one thing in common, right? And that, and that is that each describe individuals who are very obviously not Christians. And therefore, to enter into any sort of relationship with them, especially marriage, uh, romantic, whatever it is, even business, you know, is, is to be unequally yoked. Um, and that expression, unequally yoked, who knows what that means? Or who can find that? Sure, most of us do. How does the yoke have the animal? Yeah. So they're both going at the same time. They're both going in different directions. Yeah. One was an Indian, and one was a and the other was bread. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, right, so a yoke, right, was, a, was like a wooden beam that hung across the necks of two animals, usually oxen, uh, that were used for plowing, farming, stuff like that. And typically, you would have two of the same animals on that yoke because they're the same temperament, the same constitution. They would be able to do the work in a uniform manner. You put a donkey with an oxen, you're going to have all types of craziness going on, right? And, and that's kind of literally the word picture that's being described when, when, when Paul's talking in first, Second Corinthians about not being unequally yoked, right? Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14. And Mike, on that, even if you have two oxen, one is very heavy and one's extremely light, the heavier one will pull, the lighter one. So um, I think there, in principle, um, someone can pull the, the, you know, the believer down a, a, a deadly path, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at the life of Solomon. Yeah. You know, I mean, he... He, he wed all of these wives, and they turn, they, they, they turn toward idolatry very often. Yeah, yeah. 
It's the case. Um, that's like one of the sort of the most uh, uh, prolific examples of that in history. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Uh, of course, a lot of them political, but still from different lands, different religions, serving different gods, they surely pulled his heart away. And mind you, kings were counseled in the law of which each one of them was supposed to have a copy that they would read and, and, and understand, you know, frequently that they're not to multiply wives. For that reason, God told Moses and the Israelites way back then, we have kings, they get this law, they read it, they shouldn't be multiplying wives. They shouldn't have a bunch of chariots and gold and all that stuff because the Lord knows the heart, even of kings. Um, and, and that's sadly what happened with Solomon. We know from that, after him, Israel was split. Um, so there are, there are serious consequences with this, right? Just continuing in 2 Corinthians uh, 6, uh, verses 15 to 16, what accord is Christ with Belial? Uh, or what portion does a believer uh, share with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Um, and just, just really brief, the framers of this uh, confession, they use two proof texts to kind of further cement this idea uh, that, you know, or this warning rather, that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. Uh, and, uh, we see it in, uh, well, one, that Christians should marry in the Lord, but also that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, which reads, uh, this was concerning widows, people that, women that would have lost a husband in, in, in what certain liberties they had. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord, right? Any future husband must clearly be a true Christian. Uh, and, and if so, that applies to widows. The same principle would apply to unmarried Christians in general, right? They should only marry those who are in the Lord. Uh, the second proof text is found in Nehemiah uh, 13, verses 25 to 27. And this is a rebuke of those who returned from Babylon, Babylonian captivity. Uh, and they, they entered into marriages with non-Jews. Uh, and also they had allowed their children to do the same. And this rebuke strongly reflects uh, that often repeated prohibition to God, um, God's old covenant saints about marrying Gentiles. And he says this, he says this uh, in Exodus 34, for example, you shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram for you shall worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice um, to their gods and you are invited you eat of his sacrifice and you take of their daughters for your sons and their daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore off their gods right and so nehemiah argues against this from arguably the most well-known case in history which as we mentioned is solomon nehemiah says in nehemiah thirteen twenty six, did not solomon king of israel sin on account of such women among the many nations there was no king like him and he was beloved by his god and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin, right? This would have been like kind of the greatest example they had of like a godly king ruler. And, and, and Nehemiah is saying, this is how this man fell. Why are you guys doing the same? Uh, right? So as you can see, this is not a minor issue. Uh, you know, this concerns God's holy institution of lifelong marriage. Uh, the nature of ones joined together, if unequally yoked, they're fundamentally at odds with each other. You, you're not going to want to do the same thing, still. Yeah, I mean, you think about the strongest men in Scripture. You have, like, you have Solomon. You have, um, uh, you have, uh... Samson. Samson. Yeah, Samson, thank you. Uh, if, like, this was the issue. David. Um, yeah. 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 So the strongest man, the wisest man, and the most godly king all went down in one area. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a so big warning. Yeah. He was not like that. No, he wasn't. So if you look at wives and say, Wow, I would never do that or I would you know, that's horrible in the Bible, you know, 
came to live with us after we had done that. Mm-hmm. And yet God used Santa as one of his one of his own. And yeah. it says that in his back he put he took down more um, in his back than he did when he was, you know, fighting. Yeah. To do alone and fighting with him. Yeah. And, and that speaks to God's grace in His, in his love and His mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, and that should cause us never to be prideful when we look back at the past and we see the failings of, of those in history to think that we're above that. Um, but nonetheless, it, we should be warned, you know, because we don't want to follow in error. You know, we want to serve the Lord while we know His will uh, and certainly in the area of marriage, right? Because there are very real consequences to this. Right. Um, of course, there are instances in which one spouse in a previously unsaved marriage gets saved while the other remains unsaved. This this happens all the time, and uh, the Bible speaks to that. Right, Paul speaks to that in First Corinthians seven. Uh, I won't read for time. Um, that's for everyone else. No Christian should knowingly involve themselves and commit themselves to a relationship with an unbeliever, much less marry one. Right. If you do, they'll certainly be this chasm between you and them, right? It, it, you know, sometimes you go into thinking, as I, as I did at one point, you know, well, maybe, you know, I, I could, the Lord can use me to bring light to this person. Maybe they might save some person. We call it missionary dating, you know, and, and for, that's very presumptuous because you don't know that God will save them. Church with me, yeah, right? so that's yeah. Good. When I first got saved, I was in a relationship with, with, with a girl I was with from high school and I didn't want to leave her. And, and then I thought, Maybe if I bring her around the saints, she'll hear the word of God and she'll be saved. It was just be foolish and, and immature. But that doesn't work that way. Like the Lord, you don't know who the Lord is going to save. And so you're going you're gonna to conf- you're gonna be willing to confine yourself to a life of, of, of misery and, and hardship. That will do neither you nor that person really any good. For what? You know, you know what if your spouse wants you to do something that's sinful? What if they want you? What if they want you to raise your children in a way that's not in keeping with godliness? You guys will have different philosophies on everything: money, yeah, uh, time, where you spend it. It's it's, it's gonna t- it's gonna tear you apart. Um, and, and these considerations make consent with judgment, as the paragraph says, rather relevant. Uh, and so, to anyone who is you know potentially going to be seeking a spouse in the future, you know, be very wise, be very careful. To make sure that you don't be unequally yoked, uh, because the consequences are, are, are very real. But um, consider these words from the 20th, uh, 20th century theologian John Murray. Uh, he was a theologian that lived in Scotland. He says, married life is to be guided not by impulse or fancy, which is kind of like liking, uh, but by considerations which conserve and promote the interests of godliness. Right? So it's the chief end of man, as I mentioned earlier, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And marriage is an integral part of that. Uh, so, therefore, marriage should seek to conserve and promote that which aids man towards that end, right? We want to be more like Christ. We want to be godly and honor him with our marriages. Uh, so that concludes uh, paragraph three of the chapter. Um, sorry if I moved through anything really quick. Does anyone have any questions or comments? No, no, no questions, but, so Mike, there are several single people here in the room that one day hope to be married. Some girls, some guys, some young teenagers, what would be your counsel to them? Speak to their hearts for a moment. From your heart as a married man to a godly woman, through your teaching, and what you would want them to know. Uh, as I mentioned in the Song of Solomon, don't, don't seek to rush or force love or awaken it before it pleases. Um, trust in the Lord. If, if marriage is something you genuinely desire, pray that the Lord would prepare your heart for it. Um, prepare you to be either a good and faithful wife or husband. Grow you in maturity. That uh, I'd also counsel you that you would be wise and seek the counsel of your parents if they're if they're in the Lord, or godly brothers and sisters around you, particularly that those who are married that they can give you wisdom and instruction on what it will be like um, when you're seeking a spouse. You know, don't don't let your guard down. You know, don't be so infatuated or hung up on this person's appearance or attributes or intelligence that you fail to to take note of of the more serious things, right? How is this person 
relationship with God, right? Because it's, especially if you're if you're a wife, this is this this is a man that's going to be leading your family, your household. Uh, so uh, be wise, don't rush things, trust in the Lord, seek godly counsel, um, uh, and yeah. That's, I would just add, in, um, or expand on seeking godly counsel. Um, let them meet your pastors. Yes. Let your pastors help break them over the coals, if you will. Yeah. Right? Um, because sometimes pastors may uh, discern things that you may not, because the old adage, love is blind. Love is blind. Because you may ignore things that, that others see. Yeah. Listen. Don't move it out. Yeah. No matter how good looking they are, mm -hmm. if they're not godly, or if they pretend to be godly, you gotta snip that out. Because once you say I do, listen, I had it I had a young man that I taught at my school, and he was dating a Muslim girl. And he said, Oh, you know, I'm gonna convert one day. I said, you, you're just gonna face Mecca. He was a well, she was soon Muslim, but you're just gonna face Mecca to marry this girl. He said, Well, you want to love her? And, and here we are 10 years later, and he's and he broke he had gotten engaged, he broke up the engagement. He said, I should have listened to you 10 years ago. But he said, now I'm finally free and single, and we sent him to a reformed church and everything like that. But told him something 10 years ago, and now he listened. Yeah. Thank God he did, but yeah. his life would have been a, a wreck right now. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike, does does this comment follow that? Yeah, and Paul Paul makes that clear in Ephesians five. Okay. You read you read chapter, uh, verses twenty two to thirty three. He says like this this mystery is is about this. Um, so I so I think that's that's the main big picture grand scheme, right? But of course, marriage has you know as Pastor Phil covered last week, very practical purposes, mm -hmm. procreation. Not only that, enjoyment of each other, mutual help. Even though married couples may be preoccupied with things like how to please their spouse, at the same time, it can, it can be a great help to one another in serving the Lord. You know, it's, that's, you know, two, two pools of resources, two, you know, sets of hands, two. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, marriage uh, marriage seeks to glorify God, and it, it shows His relationship and His covenant with His people. Uh, so, yeah, there's something to look at too, like when you're married, uh, to to see the bigger picture of it, and like, wow, this what I'm doing represents that. I should do that faithfully, you know. But yeah, let's uh, let us close here so we can go into the service. Sorry for holding you, uh, Lord God. We thank you so much for marriage. We thank you for your faithfulness to your people, Lord, uh, past, present, and future. We thank you that Christ is preparing a place for us where we will be with him and with you for all eternity. O oh Lord, uh, at the marriage feast of the Lamb. O oh Lord, we pray here while we await, while the, while the bride is being made ready. O oh Lord, that we would be faithful to you in every way, O oh God. Uh, Lord, we pray for marriages uh, and marriages soon to be, marriages in the future, uh, should you, should you, unless, unless you tarry. O oh Father God, uh, that um, those who seek that would be wise, O oh Father God. Uh, would not fall into error, would not uh, compromise uh, on your word, O oh Father God, and that godly marriages and godly offspring would be produced, O oh Father. Um, we thank you so much uh, for your grace and everything. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.